All right, let's go before the throne of grace. Father, we thank you that we can worship you in prayer. We can worship you in our offerings, Lord God. We worship you in song, but we also worship you by studying your word. Holy Spirit, we ask you to open the hearts, open our hearts to receive this engrafted and implanted word that would produce much fruit. Lord, we come to be sharpened as disciples, that we would be a better witness for you in a world that is tumbling out of control, and everything is being shaken, so that which cannot be shaken, which is your church, will stand. So we thank you, Father, for this time. It blesses us more than it blesses you. But Lord God, uh, thank you for your gracious spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us. You wrote this word. You teach this word, and we ask you to minister through us this day. We tell you we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We didn't get all of last week's notes in. Uh, we're, re- we're doing a study of 1 Samuel. And of course, as we get into more, the deeper you get into Samuel, the more you get into David. And actually, it becomes not even 1 Samuel. You probably pretty sure it'd be 1 David. But anyway, uh, David has killed Goliath and uh, has risen to stardom because of that and uh, has been blessed by Saul. Uh, and he made him as a teenager. Uh, I did not know till studying this that you couldn't be in the Israeli army until you were 20 years old. But David was made captain of hundreds by the time he was 17, 15 to 17, somewhere in that area. And it says, we read over and over again that he would go out with the troops and he'd come back, he'd go out to battle and he'd come back with victory. But what was happening was the women were dancing and just uh, uh, lauding the victory that they had and the victory that God had given Israel. And as they came marching back with the triumphant armies, they said that Saul had killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And of course, that got under Dave, I mean, that got under Saul's skin because he's a very prideful man and uh, knows nothing of humility. And uh, from that point on, he just had decided that uh, he's, going to, he's going to kill David, whatever it takes. So he tries to be imaginative. In fact, it's, it's weird that the, the tact that he uses is a tact that David will use later in his life with Bathsheba and her husband. So he decides to let David marry his daughter. His oldest daughter gets, uh, gets married ahead of time, and so David doesn't get her. But Saul was, uh, had his another daughter, Mishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishmishm
Saul knew it would make the Philistines very mad because that was the covenant sign with Israel. And now you were taking these, these dead men and putting the, the Israeli covenant sign on, on their bodies. So he thought there, they'd be just mad enough that they'd be able to kill David. But again, it doesn't work. So we pick up today and we started, just started uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. If you want to follow in your Bibles, we will have this, the uh, words on the, on the uh, screen up here. 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 3. Be there. No hurry. We're good. Okay. It says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. This is after he brought back more than he thought and, was, and he didn't get killed. So he, he just wants him dead. He just wants him dead. So now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go and stand beside my father in the field where you are, or, and I will speak to my father about you, and then what I observe I will tell you. In other words, I, I will talk to my father on your behalf, and we'll really get an idea of, uh, of what he's got up his sleeve here. Uh, the, one who should, should be feel, feel, the one who should feel threatened in all of this is Jonathan, uh, but he knows his father, he knows who his father is, and he knows what his father does, and he wants no part of this anger towards David, this killing of David. In fact, he delights in his friend David. He pleads with David to hide, and he will find out his, what his father really feels about David and let David know if he should run away or if he should stay here. It's still remarkable that you look at these, uh, these two men, David and Jonathan, and I've, we've always had the idea, at least I always have, they're about equal in age, you know, buddy buddies. They are buddy buddies, but actually Jonathan is old enough to be David's father. He's about 30 years older than David. And, uh, but that doesn't stop them having a, a relationship of deep love because they're both valiant warriors. They have that in common. And uh, their, their hearts were just knitted together. There was just something that uh, pulled them together. Unfortunately, as we said a couple weeks ago or last week, that this story has been hijacked by the homosexual com community that says that this is, this is proof in here that God okays a homosexual relationship because of the love that David had for Jonathan and in return, but it's not. In fact, we took care of that because we looked at uh, the word, the actual word that is used for their relationship in the Hebrew is different from the relationship that is used when there is lust involved. There's a separate word for that in the Hebrew. It makes it very clear when the Holy Spirit inspired this that there was nothing sensual about their relationship. It was just a true heart of love uh, that they had for each other. So we go on to Samuel 19, 4 and 5. Says, that says 18, but really 19. Thus, thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sing, sin against his servant, against David, because he has, he has not sinned against you, and because his works have, been, works have been good toward you, very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed a Philistine, talking about Goliath. And the Lord brought a great deliverance for all of Israel. You saw and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Now, Jonathan takes his own life in his hands by telling his father, Saul, the truth. He's not just defending David, but he would, have, he would have said this for any innocent man. I think that was Jonathan's heart. This wasn't just about David. He knows his father is going to do something extremely wrong. He knew his father would be committing a huge sin if he, try, if he takes an innocent life. He defends David and reminds Saul of all the good things that God has done for Israel because of what David has done. So we move on to, to 19, 6 and 7. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. So here, here he is swearing to God, because he listened to what Jonathan said, that David will not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as times passed. We remember that the Lord would, because of Saul's disobedience, the Lord would allow an evil spirit to visit upon Saul and... Uh, it would bring him into a, a, a stage of, of, of being frightened and scared and uh, would put him in a foul mood. And they said, well, is there, maybe if he had music, because music has that ability to, to calm people down. Music has really some, some wonderful points to it. 
And then one, one of his counselors said, well, I know a young man named David in Bethlehem that plays the lyre and is a good singer, and they brought David in. But then that was all earlier, but now, now we're coming back to that point. Uh, so Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So probably at this point they're thinking everything's going to be okay. But then we go to 1 Samuel 19, 8 through 10. It says, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with his spear. But he slipped away from Saul's presence. That being David, he slipped away from Saul's presence as he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. So here again, how scary that must have been to have your father-in-law throw a spear at you to try to pin you to the wall. We see that at least for the moment Saul has regained his senses uh, and has David back in his, in, into, his, into his presence. And it says the peace, the peace, of course, didn't last long. Paul revokes his vow to God. He, does, he doesn't even think about his vow to God. It doesn't have any meaning to him. Uh, I asked uh, one of the circuit judges up here some time ago, some years ago. He was a Christian out of Troy. I can't remember his name right now. But anyway, I ended up sitting next to him someplace. Uh, we were talking about things, and I, he was saying how hard it is to be a judge these days. And I said... And I asked him, what was the biggest problem? He says, well, he says, everybody lies in court. He said, it doesn't matter. Anybody swears an oath before God. It doesn't matter if they take a vow before God. They're going to tell the truth. He said, nobody does. He says, so your job as a judge is to figure who's lying the least, not who's lying and who isn't. And I thought, that's a sad commentary, that there is no fear of God anymore. That people would put their hand on the Bible and swear to God, or you'd call on his name and swear to God and think nothing of it and not keep their vows. Sad thing. So we go to 1 Samuel 19, 11, and 12. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And my, M Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal, Michal let, let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Saul figures that David would probably try to sneak out in the morning, and uh, he sent men out to, wa to watch for him and to kill him. Like Jonathan, Mikhail warns her husband to flee or he's going to lose his life. So then we go to 1913. And Mikhail took an image and laid it in the bed and put a cover of goat's hair for its head and covered it with clothes. Something we've seen done in a movie so many times, he makes it look like somebody sleeping in the bed. It says, the one who should have... Uh, find out where I just was here. Michael, Mikhail does all she can. She tries to make it sound like David is sick when the men come to her. Uh, um, let's, let's, go, let's go to 1914 through 17. That's where we got it. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, he said he is sick. Or she said he is sick. Then, then Saul went to the mess, sent the messengers back to David saying back to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. Was, he wants him so dead. He, you know, if he's, right now they don't know that he's not really sick or that he's really not there. But this just shows you that if a son-in-law was sick, he, he, this is how, how angry and how resolute that uh, Saul is. He says, I don't care if you have to bring the whole bed in here. Bring him here. I want him dead. It's just that simple. I want him dead. So we go to 1918 then. 1918, where am I on? I'm on the wrong page here. That's a good year, though. 14 through 17. Okay. Of course, it's... You want 18 and 19 up there? Yeah. Okay. Let's, try, let's try 19, 19 through 24, okay? Now, it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, and they saw a group of prophets. Wait a minute, I'm still missing something. Let's keep going. My problem is I got two sets of notes up here, and I'm, I'm getting my papers mixed up. Uh, let's go to 1914 through 17. Is that that one? Uh, 
Okay, so David fled and escaped. Yep. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah, the, 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 the priest Samuel and the prophet, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Saul went and stayed in Naoth. Now that brings us to our, our lesson here, the first one. And we talked about this a lot in our adult Sunday school this morning. Let's go ahead and put the next lesson up, which is... Now look, I'm used to being confused, okay? You guys are my rock, okay? I want to be at 1 Samuel 19.18, okay? Well, next thing would be 1 Samuel 19, 19 through 24. I'll dance. I can do something. I can do something besides preach, you know. Okay. Thank you for bearing with me. Okay. 1 Samuel 19, 19 through 24 says, but before we get to that, I wanted that next teaching. You don't have the next teaching. The next teaching is, when in distress, seek godly counsel. You don't, you don't have that one? We're trying to pick these nuggets out as we go through this. Would have been right after 1 Samuel 19, 18. Well, that's the lesson. One in distress, seek godly counsel. And uh, that's something I wish I knew when I was younger. It's always good to get counsel. It's always good to get godly counsel. I don't know if I ask, the, unless somebody has done something and it's a worldly issue and somebody in the world has done that, I'd ask their opinion. But uh, when it comes to things of God, you want to ask godly counsel. The problem, problem I have is, is you want wise counsel. And there's so many Christians that you can go to for, or you would think you could go to for counsel, but you'll find that so many Christians are intimidated with the lack of faith about things that... Uh, you know, they're just kind of the old school of, a, you know, a poor old sinner saved by grace, and you're not going to get very far with them. So you want to, you want to ask, when in distress, you want, to, you want to seek godly counsel, which is what David's doing by going to Samuel. He really has no one else to, to talk to about this. How about 1 Samuel 19.13? Can we do that? That's one I already read. Okay. And we talked about him bringing the bed in and he'd kill them. He wanted to kill him. So David, 19.18, so David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him that Saul had done to him and he and Samuel went and stayed at Naoth. Next one is 19, 19 through 24. He says, Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David at Na- is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. He wants him dead, whether he comes back dead or alive. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying there at Naoth, this was the school of the prophets, and Samuel led that. And Samuel has all these men prophesying, and he's walking around them, standing as the leader over them. The Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. They couldn't get to David. It shows how God can do anything he wants, and even on these evil men that are going out to kill David, he can make them prophesy under the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Spirit came upon the messengers of Paul, Paul or Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. They can't get past this barrier of prophecy. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Then he also went to Ramah. If I've got, got to do it myself, I'll do it myself. Then he also went to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Sekhu. So he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are at Naoth and Ramah. So he went there to Naoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went out and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. He, he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all the day and all the night. Therefore, people said, is Saul among the prophets? Because they thought he had become a prophet because of that. All right.
That's the last of that one. Okay, we're going to be easier now. We're just going to start the new one. You got the new one? All right, all right. So we break into Samuel chapter 20. Let me push this aside or I'm going to get them mixed up again. Okay. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. David knows that they're coming for him. He says, Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan. He, he goes to find Jonathan, his good friend. He says, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? He's getting fed up with it. And you can't blame him. You know, why is your father trying to kill me? What have I done? How have I hurt him? What have I done to him? Why is he seeking my life? So Jonathan said to him, by no means, he said, by no meaning, my father's not going to kill you. You shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? From me, if it, from me, it is not so. Okay, now give me a second. Okay, David believes, we just read 20 verse 3. Let's do 20 verse 3. Then David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he said, Do not let Jonathan know about this, lest he be grieved. In other words, he's saying, Jonathan, you think your father's going to tell you everything, but he knows that we're tight, he knows the relationship that we have, how much we love each other and care for each other. And he probably doesn't want you to be grieved, so he's, he's, he's coming after me without letting you know about it. And uh, he says, he says, we're, he says, uh, he says, as truly as the Lord lives and as your, as your soul lives, there is but a step between, between, a step between me and death. That's how David feels about it. He's one step away from being killed. And that's what's frustrating him. He doesn't know why Saul's doing this, and he doesn't think that Jonathan has any answer, although he tries. And uh, that brings us to our next lesson, which we should have. This is the lesson. And I, I know these are things we all know, but something that's good to go back and look at once in a while. We are all one step away from death. That's what David said. I'm one step away from death. We should live, we should live, it's supposed to be every, we should live every day with this attitude. Scripture tells us it is presumptuous to think that we know what tomorrow might bring. That's a good truth. We find that once you've, once you've sold out to that fact that you take one day at a time, when somebody says you're going to do something tomorrow or do this or do that, you say, if the Lord wills, because you don't know. And I have seen something that has got to me over some years now, is that how I don't believe anybody goes home as long as they've got kingdom work to do here. I think we go home after we have finished our work for God. And... The thing I see is, though, is sometimes we don't think we're done when God tells us we're done. I know of some pastors that have been pretty young that have been uh, taken away. And uh, you would think, Lord, the way the world's going right now and the need for good pastors, you know, and good teachers, uh, you know, why would this person die? But God knows the timetables and he knows exactly what's needed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, he told, uh, you know, Talking to, to Moses, he said, talked about numbering our days, setting them in order, because we don't know. We are all one step away from death. Uh, especially this gets me when you've got people, uh, talk to uh, people and read about people that are missionaries and they're also evangelists and they go around to churches, and I've shared this with you before, that in many churches they don't want to talk about end time things. They don't want to talk about the rapture of the church. And when they said, you can talk about anything you want in this church, but don't talk about end times because it makes our people nervous. It makes you nervous. If you don't want to talk about the rapture, then you certainly don't want to talk about the, uh, the resurrection because that's our resurrection is the rapture. That's, that's the beginning of our wedding when Christ comes to get us and we meet with him in the air. But if the, these people are afraid, I, I guess maybe they're afraid of death. 
as a Christian, that's the last thing we should be is afraid of death. We, we welcome death. We don't, we don't go after it foolishly. But we, Paul said, death is gain. We realize that. It's, it's, it's not a destination. It's transportation for us. And, uh, you know, every day, honestly, every day I get up, I say, well, Lord, you must have something else for me to do. Or I wouldn't be here this morning. And so you do what you're supposed to do, which is present yourself before God as a living sacrifice. You know, that's not on special occasions, guys. This is something we're supposed to do every single day. You know, when this is one of my big beefs about what happens in the church. People still seem to use their priest or their pastor as the go-between to God. They'll say, well, I know that Jesus died for my sins, but you stop there. Now, dying for sins is fundamental, but the reason, there's a reason that Christ died for our sins. And it isn't just so we can have eternal life. It is so that we can have fellowship with God. How many people miss that? You know, I mean, they really do. They, you know, all they know is that, they, that, that I'm okay because I know Jesus died for me. But you don't understand is why Jesus died for you, which was to give you a new nature. Why do you need a new nature? Because you want to be one-on-one -on -one with God. That's why John, in 1 John, says that we are, he says, we're, we're inviting you to a fellowship. He said, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Church is a fellowship where we all come together under the, under the auspices of the Holy Spirit and, and Christ Jesus. And it's, it's here that we learn to love each other and care for one another. And when you, when you look at what happened, when, when you look at what happens at, at Calvary, I got to go over this a minute. When you look at what happens at Calvary, we've talked about how for a lot of us, it was told us that when the resurrection happened on Easter Sunday morning, that that was God's stamp of approval that Jesus had been uh, accepted as the eternal sacrifice, which is true, but it's not, it doesn't begin there. It begins at the moment of his death. Uh, if we could see in the spirit just how fast everything started moving, it's the moment Jesus died, the, the moment that he willed himself to die. You know, nobody took his life at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, even though that's when the Passover lambs were being slain. He is our Passover lamb. He dies at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But he doesn't die because of the spear. He doesn't die because of the whippings. He died because he forced himself to die because he said, this is my life. It's been given to me by God. No one takes it from me. No one lays it down but me. He says, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to lift it up again. So Jesus died of his own accord at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, the, and immediately when he dies, the last thing he says is, it is finished. Those are the last words out of his mouth. And the moment he says it is finished, you read, read immediately that the temple curtain was torn from the top, not from the bottom, torn from the top into top to bottom. And I told you, if you think about what it would have been like to have been in the temple that day with all the Sabbath offerings that are going on for the Passover, people would have been screaming and running for their lives, including the priest, because this is the curtain to the Holy of Holies. Nobody goes into the Holy of Holies except the high priest, and that only once a year, and with fear, and with trembling, and with blood. But why did that happen? Because the Holy Spirit left. It wasn't that, oh, now we all have access to God. No, we all, He now has access to us. Think about that. That's a big difference. It's not us having access to God. It's God having access to us. God wants us. When God spoke to Moses in that fiery bush that wasn't consumed, and he says, Moses, stop! Don't come any closer. This is holy ground. That was not an arrogant God saying, hey, you're getting too close to my holiness, back it up. But no, it was a sorrowful God. It was a sorrowful God. I remember David Reagan of Christ and Prophecy, good man of God, been around a lot of years. They asked him one day, they're having to talk about heaven, and they said, they said, David, what will heaven be like to you? He said, heaven for me will be to hold my, my grandchild, my grandson. He has a very rare disease. He cannot be touched. He will scream in agony if he is touched. He lives in a special room that has very padded walls, uh, very soft. They have to knock him out to cut his hair. He can't stand the pain of having his hair cut. And he said, all I want to do, he said, heaven for me is on this earth, I cannot hold my son. We don't have, the, the, it's not right. The, 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 the things are not right. He's sick. He's got the disease. I want to hold my son and I can't hold my son. And that hit me so hard. It's exactly what God was saying from the burning bush. He, he, don't you know his heart was breaking? We're his creation. We're his children by creation and then by new birth. And all God wants to do is love us. 
He's not there to, to work. I mean, if you say, well, God has the right to be proud and puffed up. The Bible says he's love. It says love is never proud. Love is never puffed up. God is not proud. God is not puffed up. All God wants is a relationship. And for some people, it's like, you mean God wants to be personal with me? It's all about being personal. There's a lot of blood that was shed, a lot of anger, a lot of agony that Jesus went through to make it personal that we could have a relation with God. So much so that he makes us the temple, he makes us the sacrifice, and he makes us the priesthood. I don't care what you all think. I don't care what your, your tradition is. I'm telling you what the Bible says. God wants you. So, and this gets me in trouble because it, it always comes down to Roman Catholicism. But, when you, but it also affected me in the Lutheran church growing up. Is you had, you remember how you, the, 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 when the priest or the, uh, the pastor is talking to the congregation, he's speaking for God to the congregation. He turns his back. He speaks to God for the congregation. And then when you look at Ephesians 4, that says when Jesus was ascending into heaven, he gave gifts to the church. Gifts that he gave. Not the Holy Spirit. These aren't Holy Spirit gifts. These are Jesus-given gifts, among which are apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, is what it says. Nowhere does it say the priesthood. Then people will say, are you saying the priesthood doesn't matter? I'm saying the priesthood is so fundamental, and it matters so much that God has made every one of us a priest, man and woman. We are a royal priesthood unto God. So we are the priesthood. Then he says in Romans that we should present ourselves before the God daily, and he says that we are holy and acceptable in his sight. And we don't, that's nothing we have to do. It's what he's made us. He's made us holy and acceptable. He's made us the temple. The Bible says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? In fact, that's a bad translation in the Greek. It says literally, don't you know that your... I don't think the King James translators could handle it because it literally says, don't you know that your body is the holy of holies? The most holy place on earth was the holy of holies. Now that comes into us. So now we have been made holy. We still sin. We have a sin nature we have to deal with yet, but it's not like it was before. Our, our nature has been changed which is what this is all about. Why was our nature changed? Why did we need a new... Because you got to remember again, if all, if all Jesus died for was to take our sins, we had that under the old covenant. You had the forgiveness of sins, and you came back year after year after year after year because you, you did the same sins. Why? Because nothing in you was changed. And for 2,500 years, that was the way it was. And then Jesus comes to give us and an, an, an make us a new being in Christ, to make us a whole new creature in Christ. The, the Bible says, and again in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it says we cannot go on in our sin because we have been, we have been born again with incorruptible seed. That word seed in the Greek is the word sperma. We have been changed by the sperm of God in our spirit as he has entered into our spirit and made his home here. And we are... If you are born again in Christ, I don't mean you're a nominal Christian playing the game. I'm talking about if you have been born again in Christ Jesus, knowing Him as Lord and Savior, you are as holy now as you ever will be. So the only thing we're waiting for is the rapture of the church to give us that new body to go with that incorruptible spirit that we have. And so if God has made us the, us the temple and he's made us the priesthood, and he's made us the sacrifice, and we're supposed to take it daily. What is, you think God doesn't want to be personal? Does God say, give it to your preacher? Does God say, give it to your priest? He says, no, I expect this from you. The priesthood is a, you know, they used to represent me, but now, because of the change in everybody, you know, it's not the priest being born again, it's not the pastor being born again, it's everybody being born again. Being that we are born again, we have access to the Father, and he has access to us. We have fellowship with one another because there's no, there's no sin in God at all. And we have fellowship with him. Oh, I get wound up about that. But you realize how many Christians don't understand this? How many Christians have a real relationship with God? I don't mean talking to him in the Bible. That's good. I'm not talking about just reading the Bible. That's great. I'm talking about, is he your best friend? Do you talk, have you talked to him a hundred times today already? Have you said, Papa, did you see that eagle take off? Papa, did you see that deer run across the road? My goodness, Dad, look, look, at the sun, look, at the, look at the morning sunshine. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I remember driving down to Clarksville one day, and I saw this hawk go into the ditch next to where I was driving, and I thought, what was that all about? And all of a sudden, he comes back up, and he's got a snake in his talons. I thought, wow, that was such a picture of nature. that I said, Lord, did you see that? You know, what do you think God is? He's your dad. We have the right through inheritance and the adoption to, be, to call him Abba, which is, the, is that close name of father. Not even a slave could call the master Abba, but we're told to call him dad. 
You know, and because he, he wants a relationship with us. And so here Jesus goes to, let me be blunt. Jesus goes to, and it's literally true, Jesus goes through all the hell he went through so that we can have a relationship with God. And most Christians don't have a relationship with the Father. If they're doing good, if they talk to Jesus in, in some prayer. Prayers are good. But you've got to get beyond prayer to a relationship. He's your best friend. Do you think the disciples talked to Jesus in prayer all the time? They talked one to each other, one to each other. And when he came back, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who will be to you what I was to you. So what do you think they're going to do? Pray to the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a give and take, give and take. So, you know, this, this is just burns me because I feel sorry for God because when Moses is approaching, he says, Stop! Don't come any closer, Moses. But he's got to fix the problem because he wanted to hold Moses. He wanted Moses to come up to him. He wanted to be one with him. He wanted him to be his father. He wanted him to be his son. But he couldn't do it because sin separated. I'm on holy ground and you're not. And since you can't do it on your own, I'll make the way to which I can move you to holy ground. And we're going to be on holy ground together. And that's a bunch of holy rollers going to have a good time. Somebody say amen. This is the heart of the gospel that people are missing. God wants a relationship, a personal relationship. So much so, he made you the temple. He made you the priesthood. He made you the sacrifice. Already holy, already acceptable in his sight. He's done everything to allow you to come before that throne of grace. We go from, don't come any closer, Moses. We go to, come boldly before the throne of grace. Why can we come boldly before the throne of grace when Moses couldn't approach him in a burning bush? Why, why can you and I stand before that throne of absolute holiness and power? Because we have been made like him. We are his children. We have his nature. And all he wants to do is commune with us. If, I'll tell you what, if you're not talking to God, you're going to have an awful lonesome eternity because that's what we're going to be doing is talking to God for the, for the next umpteen, 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 umpteen years. Well, if I don't do anything before I die, I want everybody to realize this. He wants a relationship with you. He just wants to be your dad, and he just wants to love you. And he couldn't do that as long as sin was in the way, so he put your sin on his son. Not the act of sin. He took your sinful nature, your nature, and put it on his son who never knew sin. So do you understand how that breaks God's heart when we don't talk to him? He's the one that poured out his wrath on his son so he wouldn't have to pour it out on us. And then we don't talk to him. We don't say anything. Or it's a formal prayer. Formal prayers are fine. But just talk to him. Okay. Well, well guys, we'll try to pick this up again next week. We're, done. We're going to have communion now. And I think we've got a good segue into communion this morning. So, Ben, if you and Dave would please take the elements out to everybody. We, say, we have an open communion. All we ask is that you know, know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're welcome to take communion with us in the body of Christ. If you don't want to, that is fine. That's your option. I got to go in early today. I got to go in early today. Remember that. Today's the day.
Thank you, gentlemen. Well, Father, we thank you for all that you shared with us this day. And Lord, as we look at what's in our hands and we look at the cost of relationship, the shed blood, the broken body, all that this represents. Forgive us our sins and our iniquities. Forgive us where we have not loved you, enjoyed you, had the fellowship with you that you so, so desire that you would put your son through this so that we could know you. So that we could, like the song says, that we could be a friend of God. Father, thank you for loving us this much. Would we have done this to know you? No, you did this while we were still your enemies. So we just thank you for this rich blood and for this broken body. Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us even as much as the Father does. You were happy to die for us. You were happy to expand the family. You were happy to have brothers and sisters that would stand with you before the throne of our Almighty Father. Thank you for what you gave for this relationship, Lord. May we love you, speak with you, enjoy you as much as you enjoy us. And remember this every day, what it cost. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Go ahead, guys. Father, we thank you, and we ask you, Lord, to seal this teaching into our hearts, Lord, that we can share it with others. So many don't understand, Lord, not that we're perfect or any means, we've got a lot to learn, but Lord, we have learned this, that you want this relationship of love. Use us for your, the expansion of your kingdom and your family in this week. Make the divine appointments for our life. Keep us by your grace in these turbulent times. Surround us with your holy angels, Lord God, be a shield to us. And Lord, just use us for your glory. We ask that, we receive that, and we love you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Have a great week, beloved. Remember again that uh, Christian Sloan will be here next week. I, you're just going to love him. I just know you will. <laughs>